Welcome to the program, ladies and gentlemen. I hope that this finds you and your family doing well, and I want to thank you very much for joining me. We continue our series on spiritual warfare, and this is episode four. And Jim, in this episode, we're going to be talking about another very, very common uh, practice of the so-called modern spiritual warfare experts, and that is dealing with binding and rebuking Satan or yeah. demons. And and this is not just relegated to the Word of Faith and New Apostolic Reformation. Uh, this is in more mainstream evangelical circles. I heard this a lot growing up um, that we can bind and rebuke Satan. So what's wrong with that? Walk us through some of these issues. Yeah, you'll, uh, you'll hear people say this oftentimes in church services. We just want to bind Satan from his influence in this church service, this worship service, and this evangelistic campaign. And yep. And the teaching is that, uh, the belief is that if we say the words, I bind you Satan, or I bind Satan, that we can somehow hinder his power, his influence, or his effect on, again, a geographical location, a place, or a person, or an event. And that is all part of the territory view. We need to bind him to keep him from influencing a certain, a certain locale. Um, I used to have a good friend who prayed this sometimes before church services, and, and it was always kind of disturbing. Um, the, the idea that this would strip Satan of his power or of his ability to influence us, that's, that's what we're describing here. i give you some examples of it. Um, I heard this in a Bill Gothard seminar. Bill Gothard teaches this. Yeah. Neil T. Anderson in his Steps to Freedom and, and his uh, manuals on spiritual warfare also talks about binding Satan. Uh, Pat Robertson of the 700 Club and during one of his Bring It On segments, which I guess is a Q&A. Yeah, it is. You watch far more of this nonsense than I do, but... <laughs> Robertson was asked one time a question by a man named Gilbert who asked this, our household has been under attack lately by the devil. Are we supposed to rebuke the devil in Jesus' name or just look to God to take care of the matter for us? And here was Robinson's, Robin, Pat Robertson's uh, response. He said, quote, I think you need to wage spiritual warfare and you need to understand what you're doing. But uh, I, I, I think we should say, if you want something to say is, I bind you Satan and the forces of evil and... In the name of Jesus, I bind your power, which means you nullify the power of what he's exercising against you. That is the way you deal with the situation, close quote. So you'll notice that Robertson says you need to wage spiritual warfare. And then what is spiritual warfare to him? It is uttering the words, I bind you, Satan, or I bind your power. And he says this is supposed to nullify the power of what Satan is bringing against us. So just by uttering the words, you're nullifying that power. You're right. canceling out. It's, it's Harry Potter going against Gandalf or Darth Vader or whoever his mortal enemy is, is at the time. Yeah. It's, I utter these words, and in uttering those words, I'm canceling out your power. Yeah. So Satan's going to try something else, but then I just utter those words, and that cancels out that power. And it's probably a good idea that you bind Satan before you rebuke him. You don't want to rebuke him before you bind him. because you, wanna... you rebuke me before you bind me, I'll slap you. Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so binding first, then rebuke. You wouldn't want right. to rebuke an unbound Satan. So... Um, but again, there is some spiritual uh, mention of this, or scriptural, I should say, mention of this. And the primary text is out of Matthew's gospel. You see it in Matthew 12, Matthew 16, Matthew 18. I'd say Matthew 18 is probably the primary text. Mm -hmm. But um, I'll, I'll read some of these, and we'll focus on, on Matthew 18. But anyway, Matthew 12:29. Jesus says, how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man? And then he will plunder his house. Matthew 16, 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. And Matthew 18, 18, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. So Jim, it sounds to me like there's an awful lot of binding going on here. A lot of binding and a lot of loosening. So I'll deal with all three of these passages, kind of give okay. an overview of each passage. But first of all, in none of these passages is Jesus teaching lessons on spiritual warfare. None of these verses that we read were precipitated by the disciples coming up and saying, Lord, teach us how to deal with the devil. That was never at, at all. This is right. in the midst of Jesus' teaching. Jesus is using this language of binding and loosing to describe something. So the question is, what is he? What is it? it is the what is it that is being bound and loosed in those passages? Right. In Matthew chapter twelve, Jesus has been rejected by the Pharisees, and so he is dealing in that passage with their rejection of his messianic claims, and he describes there his power over the demonic as an evidence that he was the Messiah. 
In other words, their accusation that he was doing this by the power of Satan, Jesus is saying, no, if I did that, then I'm, the house is divided against itself. Yeah. But he is pointing to his ability to deliver people from demons, to exercise demons, as an evidence of his messianic claims. So Jesus is simply saying, look, I obviously have the power to bind the strong man, which is Satan. And if I have power over him, then I'm not doing it by his power. I'm right. exercising power over him. Right. And he's not giving us there a lesson on spiritual warfare at all. It's not a universal command. We're not told to do the same. Uh, it is an historic illustration of Christ's power over Satan. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is describing him building his church. I will build this church. And mm -hmm. he is talking to his disciples there. In, in Matthew 16 and in Matthew 18, the language does not translate into English very well. And you can kind of see this if you start looking at the language and the verb tenses that are using, uh, used. I think the NASB has it best when it tries to say, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. Right. And whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. Um, that's probably right. the best way of trying to translate and capture the essence of what that is describing there. It's describing heaven's decrees in Matthew 16 and 18. It is the decrees of heaven that are being described there. So in that context, the terms deo and luo for binding and loosing, those were rabbinic phrases used in Jesus' day by the rabbis to describe permitting or forbidding something. Permitting or forbidding something. So, for instance, when it, it is in a, what is called the future perfect indicative um, tense, it describes something that is in a state of completion. And so a translation in the English would read, whatever you bind on earth is that which shall already have been bound in the heavens, and whatever you loose on earth is that which shall already have been loosed in the heavens. Right. And so in Matthew chapter 16, where it's describing Christ building the church and Peter announcing the terms of admittance into the kingdom and out of the kingdom by the preaching of the gospel, the idea is that which you announce on earth in conjunction with me building my church is that which I have already decreed in heaven. It right. is heaven's decree that you are announcing on earth. The right. binding and the loosing there has nothing to do with binding demons or satanic forces or, or even Satan himself. It has to do with announcing what is permitted and forbidden in the church as God's representative of what he has permitted and forbidden in heaven. Right. And the, the one that you mentioned is probably most the most key one is Matthew chapter 18 where uh, Jesus is describing their church discipline. And again, it's a translation issue there and it's the same words that is being used. That rabbinic language, which the Jews would have understood, and Matthew references it, Matthew in a Jewish gospel written to Jews, for Jews, the Jews would have understood that language of the day that Jesus employs there. Yeah. Um, it's a rabbinic phrase used to describe what is permitted and forbidden. And the essence of it is what you decree or declare on earth in the context of church discipline is that which will have already been permitted or forbidden, decreed and decided, settled in heaven. Right. In other words, in church discipline, we are to announce heaven's decree on this situation, knowing that there are where two or three are gathered together in that context, that Christ is there and that we are announcing as under shepherds in his church, as those who are his, what heaven has already decreed regarding this issue. Right. That's, that's the essence of that. And church discipline is something that's almost foreign to the evangelical world now. Hardly any churches do this. Right. But you have to look at this in context. This is not talking about uh, binding Satan or loosing or whatever you want. It's not a blank check as many people have taken this. Right. It's not at all. It's, it's saying if, if a brother is in sin, uh, at least a professing brother in sin, you follow these steps, you go to him in private if he doesn't, if he repents, wonderful, praise the Lord, you have won your brother. If not, uh, you take two or more with you. If not, then you tell it to the whole church. And if he repents, he's loosed from his sin, mm -hmm. right? And he's restored to right fellowship with the body of Christ, local body of Christ. Uh, and if he and if, if he doesn't, if he refuses to repent, then he's still bound in his sin. And, mm -hmm. and whatever action you take, you know that heaven agrees with you mm -hmm. because you follow the steps prescribed by Christ in Matthew 18, in church discipline. Right. Nothing to do with binding Yeah, Satan. we have the permitting and the forbidding of heaven behind us in right. what we announce on earth. That's all that is. Right. Nothing at all to do with the satanic or the spiritual realm. And, and, and teachers who teach this are not even, they're not even consistent. There's Notice in all these passages, there's, there's binding and loosing. And here people quote that, right. but they'll say, therefore I bind Satan. Well, who's loosing in that? Who's, who's doing loosing? the loosing? Right. If the binding refers to Satan, then what does the loosening refer to? Exactly. Yeah, I know. I have a clip in my seminar of Joseph Prince saying this, saying that we can bind sickness. If you have cancer or multiple sclerosis or whatever, you bind it because whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, he says. 
but he never says what the loosening what is part. It, what do, how is it that we loosen? Tell me, give me the theology of loosening. What does it refer right. to? What does it describe? And how are we to employ it if we're to bind Satan? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, for all these people going around binding Satan, someone sure keeps letting him back out. Right. You know, maybe I'll find the fellow who's letting him back out and bind him first right. and then go bind Satan. Right. So just, you think this through logically, it doesn't even make any sense. Yeah, or, or they think that eventually Satan gets loose on his own. Right. He has power to, to get loose out of it. So you got to keep binding him and keep binding him and keep binding right. him. And uh, another pr problem or issue with this practice is that there is no example of the apostles doing this. You can read through the book of Acts in vain and you will not find Peter standing up on the day of Pentecost and binding Satan so that he has no effect there so that the gospel can go forth. Right. You never see Paul walking into Athens in a city over, overrun with idols and binding demons or binding Satan. Exactly. There's no example of apostle ever doing this before an evangelistic campaign in a church, over a person, over an event, over a geographic location, there's no apostolic precedent for it whatsoever. Right, right, absolutely, yeah. Um, and Satan is not bound. Satan is not bound, that's what I was just about to say. No, I, Re I, Revelation 20 is the when Satan will be bound, that is yet future. And uh, right now, Satan prowls about like a roaring lion right. seeking whom he may devour, it doesn't sound very bound to me. Yeah, So. Yeah. There, there are no, there's no rope in the armor of God. No rope chains, handcuffs, nope. nothing like that. and So it's, it's a bunch of, uh, again, it's a bunch of hocus pocus. It's like the hedges of protection. You're, you're, it's a, become like a, a theological abracadabra. And you yep. think you're doing something profound by using these words, binding or hedges, you know, all this stuff, but it, but it has no biblical support whatsoever. No, none. So Jim, I suppose we can't bind Satan. Uh, there's only one who can do that and it's none of us. But what about rebuking Satan? What about rebuking yeah. Demons. Yeah, this is another practice that is kind of uh, that is kind of tied in with binding the devil. You'll you'll hear this commonly if you watch TBN. You'll hear this all the time, rebuking the devil. Right. Um, people will think uh, that they can. This is another thing that just kind of creeps into evangelical lingo. You know, you're struggling with the demon of temptation. I rebuke you, Satan. You can't bring that temptation against me. That's the idea. It's a, it's a verbal command. The idea is that we need to verbally command or rebuke Satan. In the last episode we talked about hexes, you kind of got that idea of a verbal command. You have to say out loud, I renounce and repudiate and announce to Satan. See, by our words, again, we're talking about a, a method of spiritual warfare or mm -hmm. spiritual ideology where by our words we create these spiritual warfare. By our words we are operating in the spiritual realm, cr uh, pushing back kingdoms of darkness, etc. So in rebuking Satan, it is by my words that I am somehow slapping him up alongside the face and giving him a, right. you know, sending him cowering. I, if I say I rebuke you, then he's got to put his fork tail between his legs and go running off into the the, the corners of the shadows. Exactly. So that is, exactly. and, and part of the problem here is that we, we as Christians have bought the idea that we have the power or the authority to rebuke the devil. That this right. authority is ours because we're in Christ. And that's is commonly taught in these circles that you have this authority, and we'll deal with this I think in the next episode, you have this authority and therefore you need to exercise it by giving the devil the what for yeah. and rebuke him every once in a while. Right. So I'll give you an example of this. Sure. Uh, Britt Merrick in his blog um, in May of 2010 wrote this, when we are called upon to deal with demons while we're on the mission for Christ, we should deal with them the same way that Christ did. Jesus verbally commanded demons to leave. And he starts, cites Mark chapter five, verse eight. Subsequently, we see the church in Acts following the same model, Acts 16, 16 through 18. The model that we have set before us is the verbal command and the rebuke of demons. So, uh, close quote. So there he is saying that we have the authority and the responsibility to handle the devil the same way that Christ did. As if there is no distinction between us and the Lord Jesus Christ exactly. in how we handle, handle demons. Um, and then in attempting to answer the question, why does God ask us to speak directly to demons? Merrick writes this, quote, There is nothing in scripture that indicates that demons can hear our thoughts, read our minds, or be conscious of our inner dialogue. We must rebuke them by speaking out loud. Jesus gave us authority to cast out demons in his name. He quotes Mark 16, verse 17, and displayed for us the model of verbally commanding them. Close quote. Now I could go on and give you examples from Mark Bubeck and Neil T. Anderson and mm -hmm. uh, Pat Robertson and start naming the names of people that you've seen all, do this. All of them. Yeah. Yeah. And all of them will say this, that we have the authority to command demons and they must do our bidding just as they did Jesus' bidding. Right. And so, of course, this works out into the, the realm of uh, that we are going to, we're going to bind them um, because we have the verbal authority to do that. 
We're going to rebuke them because we have the verbal authority to do that. We're going to exercise them, cast them out because we have the authority to do that. So again, it is by and in our words as if they are containers of some force in themselves. We are, right. by our mantra, by the words that we use, we are exercising this power over the demonic. Right. And, and this is to make a couple of hermeneutical errors, is it not? It's to, it's to conflate the person and work of Christ with that of ourselves, yeah. that because Jesus did something, we can do something. Of course, the citation of Mark 16, I mean, that's a whole other issue, mm -hmm. but that's a very questionable um, uh, use of, of, of the end of that chapter as well. But, um, and also, you know, things that the apostles did, well, those were apostles, they were commissioned by Christ, and they had the ability from Christ to perform the signs and wonders of an apostle, 2 Corinthians 12, 12. Yeah. There are no more apostles today. And so uh, if there are no more apostles today, why should we think that we can do all of the things that the apostles did when those were sign gifts done by the apostles, right. not even in the apostolic era, these, these signs and wonders were not done by people at large. They were not done by believers at large. It says uh, in Acts 2 that these were being done uh, at the hands of the hands apostles. Of the apostles yeah. So it, it, even there in, in the apostolic age, it makes a distinction between the, the role of the apostles and, and believers at large. And given that there are no more apostles today, why should we think that we can do what they could do? Yeah, and spiritual warfare experts would say that because we are seated with Christ in the heavenlies, uh, most of these treatments of these doctrines begin with them describing our exalted position with Christ. He has seated us in the heavenlies with Jesus Christ. We are raised up there. We're seated with Him. We are in Him. And therefore, His since His death is ours, since His resurrection is ours, since His ascension is ours, His authority is ours as well. Yeah. And uh, I beg to differ. I do not believe that we as Christians have the divine authority to just simply speak and make it happen. Right. We don't have authority over weather. We don't have authority over fabricating food out of thin air. We don't have the authority over church, uh, civil governments. We don't have authority to raise up kings and put down kings. Why should I think we have the authority over demons? Right, right. There's a, a, a movie that was out a few years ago entitled um, The War Room, or War Room, mm -hmm. and it was the main character in the movie was Priscilla Shire, and I can't remember her name in the, in the movie. Uh, Beth Moore was also in there. And in the kind of the climatic scene in that movie, Priscilla Shire, her marriage was falling apart. Her husband was a, you know, a, a, a reprobate, and uh, Priscilla Shire just had enough of it. And one night in her kitchen, she just stormed out of her house and she started yelling to Satan. She said, "Satan, I bind you. I rebuke you. You, you have no place in this home. I cast you out to the place from which you came, and all that kind of stuff." Very, very dramatic scene. Mm -hmm. uh, but with that in mind, I want us to go to Jude verses mm -hmm. eight through ten, and and kind of put this in a little bit of perspective. Jude verses eight through 10, Jude writes, yet in the same way these men also by dreaming defile the flesh and reject authority and revile angelic majesties. But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these men revile the things which they do not understand in the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning, unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. And there's a similar passage in 2 Peter chapter 2. Really the whole book is talking about false teachers. Yeah. And so here you have Michael the archangel, and he had a dispute with the devil, and it says he did not dare pronounce a railing accusation against Satan. Yeah. Rather said, the Lord rebuke you. So if Michael the archangel would not rebuke Satan, is it a good idea for us to try to do it? Yeah, I, I don't think so. In fact, what Jude is saying is this is the mark of a false teacher. Exactly. The mark of a false teacher is that they think nothing about the authority of angelic messengers. And he uses there as an example uh, Michael not rebuking the devil. Michael knew his place, mm -hmm. and, and Michael kept it, and he knew the Lord's place in this. Right. And the difference is that a false teacher does not know his place. A false teacher boldly... A false teacher boldly jumps in where angels fear to tread. We could say that. Uh, like a fool, he jumps in and does what an angelic messenger like Michael is not willing to do. Right. Um, Michael is not willing to rebuke devil, but a false teacher is. Yeah. And uh, so that passage is very instructive. And again, Second Peter chapter 2, the other one that describes that, um, this is the mark of a false teacher. They, they've thumbed their, they, they thumb their nose. They, they think nothing of mm -hmm. just speaking evil against them. And, and it's not uncommon to t tune into... 
TBN or some other one of these programs and see these people just railing against Satan as if as if victory over Satan is um, right. goes to the person who can insult him the most. Yeah. You know, call him names and kick him and spit on him and spit at him and and uh, revile him and, and it's just it's an absurd clown show the way these guys treat demonic beings. It's it's a very cavalier approach to something that's very serious. Yeah, and and I could give I mean there's literally thousands of examples of this. I, I dare say you could not watch TBN for a single day and not not see this. It yeah. is absolutely ubiquitous. And it's common in non-charismatic churches too, but it's really sobering, Jim, when you think about that, that Peter and Jude are describing the activity and the behaviors of false teachers. Right. This is what marks the marks a false teacher. One of the things, anyway, that marks a false teacher is reviling angelic majesties, as you said, having no respect uh, uh, for for these angelic majesties, for angels or demons, and and revile them, and they yeah. do these things that they don't understand, and by these things, Jude says they are destroyed. Yeah, modern spiritual warfare experts do the same thing with rebuking Satan that they do with praying a hedge of thorns. They take a mention of something and twist it completely on its head. The hedge yeah. of thorns, which is intended to be a symbol of God's judgment upon unbelief, is taken to be a something we pray for protection for believers. Flipped it entirely around. And here they say that we as Christians should be reviling and rebuking these angelic majesties, and yet the only mentions of this in Scripture are not by way of commanding us to do it or even encouraging us or, or even an example for us to follow. Yeah. It's an example to be avoided because of a false teacher. Right. It's the false teachers who do this, not Christians. That is yeah. not how Christians uh, respond yeah. to Satan. But there is a, a, an encouraging note in this too when Michael the archangel said, the Lord rebuke you. So Michael the archangel is saying, God can do this, I can't, but right. God can do this. And so, dear friends, if you've been trying to bind or rebuke Satan and demons and all this, don't do that. That's, that's the mark of a false teacher. We have something even better. We have access through the merits of Christ to the one who actually can do yeah. these things. To right? the throne of grace. To yes. the, we can come boldly to the throne of grace knowing that we have access to God who actually can bind or rebuke demons, yeah. has power over demons and Satan through prayer, right? We mm -hmm. have prayer. So, so don't go around trying to cast out demons or bind and rebuke them. Pray. Pray to the Lord that, that His will would be done. Ultimately, this takes the focus, the, one of the problems with this practice is it takes the focus off of the Lord where it belongs and puts it on Satan. So, you know, right. when, when you're in a church service right. and you hear somebody start to do this, binding Satan, rebuking Satan, suddenly in prayer your mind is taken off of the greatness of God and His power, His majesty, and you're focusing upon Satan. I can't think of anything Satan would like more than that no very kidding. thing. Yeah. Um, but the fo it takes the focus off of the Lord. It should be on the Lord and it puts it on Satan. And it, it makes uh, our words and what we say uh, something that that is really the key to prohibiting Satan's activity rather than understanding that we just go to the Lord and we trust that the Lord, the Lord himself will deal with our enemy. Mm -hmm. And so given that there is no command in the New Testament and no example of this anywhere in the New Testament, right. you don't see the apostles ever doing this. In fact, you see the apostles warning about it, which is what we just looked at. Exactly. You don't see the exactly. apostles ever doing it. We don't see Christians ever commanded to do this, ever. Nowhere in the epistles are we commanded to do this. Then. And, and given that it takes our focus off of the Lord and puts it on the devil, how is it then that we should be dealing with the devil? And the short answer to that is that we need to, when in terms of us dealing with satanic attacks and oppression, we ought to resist and to stand. Those are the two things, those are the two words the scripture uses for us in how we are to, to wage this battle. We are to resist the devil. That means that we resist the pride that comes from him. We resist the sin that we are tempted to by him. We are to resist his attempts to trip us up. We are to resist him and we are to stand. We are not to advance and take territory. We are to stand in the victory that we have in Jesus Christ and what scripture gives to us. Right. Scripture provides us that, that, that victory and we are to stand in it and we are to stand in the truth and we are to resist him and the promise is that when we resist him, he will flee. Not when we rebuke him and not when we bind him, but when we resist him, he will flee from us. That's why it's so important that we have a daily practice, or at least regular practice of reading and studying God's Word. The importance of, uh, as Paul says in Colossians, letting the Word of Christ dwell richly within you. And the more the Word of Christ dwells richly within us, the more our minds mm -hmm. will be informed, and that is the battle. Uh, it's a battle for our, right. our minds. 
our minds will be informed by the Word of God and we will be more able to, to indeed resist Satan, resist the temptation that comes. So uh, it's, it's um, again, to use an analogy that I used a couple of programs ago, we're, we're trading in the big guns of the gospel, the big guns of progressive sanctification, the big guns of letting the Word of Christ dwell richly within us with the spitballs of, of these Binding stupid and rebuking. phrases. Yeah. yeah. So rather than, rather than giving way to Satan and his tactics and Satan and his lies, we resist them. We resist them with the truth and we resist them by standing. Yeah. And uh, we are not commanded to, again, to summarize binding and rebuking, we're not commanded to bind him. Yeah. The passages that are cited have nothing to do with spiritual warfare. Right. We're not commanded to rebuke him. And the passages that do mention rebuking the devil and reviling him are passages that warn us that that's the mark of a false teacher. So we ought not to be about Indeed. that. Instead, we are told to resist him and to stand with him. And we'll talk a little yeah. bit more about that in a future program. Yeah. There should never, ever, ever be an occasion, dear ones, in which you talk to Satan. Ever. <laughs> Don't ever talk to Satan. <laughs> You, it's a good rule of thumb. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You can and should talk to the one who does have authority over Satan, but don't talk to him. Let the word of Christ dwell richly within you. Put to death the deeds of the body, as Paul says in Romans 8.13. That's how you resist Satan. Okay, dear friends, I hope that this program has been encouraging to you, edifying to you. And uh, if you liked it, we would ask that you like this, uh, subscribe to the channel, share it with your friends, share it with your family members so that it will encourage them as well. Until our next time together, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with you all.